Hi movie lovers, have you ever wondered why the Mission Impossible movies are so darn good? Guess what, thanks to a cryptic message from the future, I'm going to explain why as I systematically go through all of the Mission Impossible movies in my new series, Tom Cruise's Movie Reviews' Part 2's is. Before I get into that though, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to like this video, if you like it. Way back in 1996, I remember watching this when it originally came out, and my teenage brain thought it was the coolest thing ever until Independence Day came out a few months later. But aliens, am I right? M.I.O.G. had everything. It had hacking, masks, spy stuff, and many Estevez finally receiving justice for being so mean to those poor hockey kids. Of course, this wasn't the first time I've been introduced to the franchise. I watched the TV series, and I'm talking about the 80s version that only lasted for two seasons. I vaguely remember the fake masks, some sort of holographic projector, and something to do with a chess match. But I never watched the 70s version, because I wasn't alive yet. Haha. <laughs> Both of those versions had Peter Graves as Jim Phelps, the only character to carry over to the movie. Peter Graves is, of course, best known as that pilot guy in Airplane. Roger. What's our vector, Victor? So for a while after that series reboot didn't last too long, Paramount, who owned it, was trying to get the movie started, but had trouble figuring out how. An established Tom Cruise also started his own production company, Cruise Wagner Productions, with Paula Wagner, his talent agent of many years. They were looking for a movie to be their first project and got Paramount to fork up $70 million for a budget to make it happen. They hired Brian De Palma to direct. He had previously directed such small films like Carrie, Scarface, and The Untouchables, you know, little indie films. This was his highest grossing film though, and unfortunately his career kind of drifted away afterwards. De Palma hired writer David Kep, who was known for such great works as Jurassic Park, Spider-Man back in 2002, and Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Well, they can't all be winners. He co-wrote Mission Impossible with Robert Townsend, known for Titan Town and collaborating with Tom Cruise on Days of Thunder. They actually rewrote the original script by Willard Heick and Gloria Katz that no one had liked. So that's what caused it to be so great. Let's look at the movie itself. It starts off with what I'm guessing is a typical scene from the show, where they make fake scenarios to get the bad guy into releasing some information, and then we get right into the opening credits that show everything that'll happen in the film, also just like the TV show. Jim Phelps, the team leader played by John Voight, gets a mission via a secret message in an in-flight movie that self-destructs. Also like the TV show. His team starts out as such. Sarah is played by Kristen Scott Thomas, known for her role in Four Weddings and a Funeral, Hannah, played by Inga Borga Dapkunyete, a Lithuanian actress who I don't recognize in anything else. Jack, played by Emilio Estevez, in an uncredited role. I'll explain later why this was done. Running out the team was Emmanuel Beert as Claire Phelps, who is a popular French actress. Again, I'm not familiar with her non-Mission Impossible work. Last is Tom Cruise as the notorious Ethan Hunt. Let's check out the gadgets the opening team has. Camera glasses, exploding gum fingerprint elevator buttons, UV filter glasses, and fancy spray. And of course, masks. Lots of masks. Let's talk about how everyone Ethan Hunt impersonates kind of looks suspiciously like Tom Cruise. Mm hmm? The plan goes awry, and one by one the team is all killed off, starting with poor Jack, and only Hunt is left. He lost the disc. He calls up his boss and's like, everyone's dead! Blah! And they meet in the most out of place looking restaurant ever. Kittredge didn't call him to help, but rather drop some exhibition and blame him. Phelps does some red light, green light, boom boom stuff and gets out. And later finds Claire, who it turned out was not dead. Suspicious. Ethan reaches out to Max, the gun smuggler who was trying to buy the knock list, and she hires him to actually steal the thing that Kittredge thinks he already did. To achieve this, Hunt hires disavowed hacker Luther Stickle, played by Ving Rames. And Claire hires disavowed French guy Franz Krieger, played by Jean Reno, and they do one of the biggest heists in movie history. The dangly from the ceiling thing to steal an item scene is parodied so many times. That scene is awesome. It's like they took a whole heist movie and condensed it into 20 minutes. After seeing his parents being dragged away in handcuffs on the news, he decides to call Gittridge and complain. But that was mostly to let them know he was in London, so they can catch Max after the handoff. But after the call, twist, Phelps is alive and back. He tries to blame everything on Kittredge, but Ethan eventually pieces everything together. <laughs> so they go to the train for the final scene, and after the drop-off, we are led to believe that Ethan is going to find Phelps, but Claire finds him first. But twist again, it's really Ethan in an Edgar, I mean, Phelps suit. Then Phelps and Hunt have the standoff on the roof, and the train with Krieger and the helicopter. And it's attached to the train, which it goes into the channel, red light, green light, the end. Hunt and Luther get reinstated. Ethan walks off into the sunset, throwing the spiral behind him. Or is he? 
Ooh, what a movie. Here's a little trivia for you. This is the only movie of the franchise that Hunt doesn't fire a gun. Zero body count. According to his producing partner, Paula Wagner, part of the heist where he stopped a few inches from the ground was the hardest stunt for him. He was really just a few inches from the ground. Earlier, I mentioned how Emilio Estevez wasn't credited for his role. This was actually to make the fact that he was in the movie a surprise. And then it surprised the audience again with his super early death. He wasn't the only actor to have such a fate in 96. Drew Barrymore was killed off in the beginning of Scream that year, as well as Steven Seagal in Executive Decision. Both of those actors were credited for their roles, however, which helped create the shock value as well. I especially remember watching Executive Decision for the first time and being super confused when Seagal died. I was like, whoa. Listen, this movie was great. Its final budget was roughly 80 million, and it only made 457 million back. So, you know, success! It was a smashing success. And this led to the green light of a sequel that would be released four years later that went some interesting new directions. Yeah, it was kind of a train wreck, but there's plenty of things in that one that are great as well. And we'll get into those next time. For now, I'm Mr. Movie Lover. I'm here to help you love the movies. Did you like that catchphrase? I'm trying to catchphrases. Let me know in the comments below. Hey, movie lovers. Did you like this review? Well, good news. I think you'll like this next one as well. And as usual, this video will self-destruct in just a few seconds.